A disclaimer, um, I am not an expert in project management. I am a data professional, a business intelligence professional. And I also have to say that ironically, um, I have been quoted as uh, talking about the tyranny of project management uh, with some of my colleagues before. So when I was talking to Chris Sorensen, who is the um, is one of the leaders of this uh, conference, and I spoke last year on data visualization, which is a, a topic that's very uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, and he mentioned, well, you know, we've got a slot for you, but it's PMing a data project. My heart sank <laughs> um, on the one hand. On the other hand, um, I actually believe that um, good project management methodology and capability is critical to be able to succeed with any, um, any endeavor. Um, you need to have a right combination of structure um, and then adaptiveness. Um, and so as a result, and I also actually have quite a bit of experience with project management systems, project management processes, organizations, um, and not just in BI and data, but also in software and even in large scale capital projects. So I agreed to take on the topic. Um, some, sometimes people talk about uh, um, teachers are those who, they say those who can't uh, do teach. And um, that, there may be an element of truth to that. But I actually think that more appropriately, I actually do a lot of soul searching because I do a lot of teaching. I also do a lot of consulting. Um, and I lead a BI practice. Um, and. Uh, my perspective on it is actually, I ask myself, why do I teach? And I actually find um, that uh, the best way to learn um, is to teach. And so my precept is that um, those who want to have a lifetime of learning um, will actually teach. So I open this up in that way because I also, I don't want to be, we talk, there's this concept of the sage on the stage and then there's the concept of the guide on the side. I think I've used that in my classes before. Um, I'm going to go through um, some of these topics and some of the things that we've been exposed to. Some of it is going to be um, kind of a no-brainer, and some of it is actually a little bit innov innovative, and some of it actually might even be uh, controversial. So open to uh, questions and comments throughout. I don't have a dense amount of material. I have um, some slides here and some topics and some things we can cover. Um, but I definitely want to open it up uh, to the room. Before we get started, um, how many people here consider themselves their primary job responsibility is a project manager? Good number, OK. Um, how many people um, do a significant um, uh, or have, uh, um, have had to uh, follow a project management methodology um, in their organization, like a strict methodology? How many people love that? How many people hated that? OK, it's a little mix of everything. So, OK, let's get started. Um, so I got five sections. First of all, I'll just talk a little bit about the different kinds of projects. I think it matters. I think it matters a lot. And there's been an evolution of project management theory and ma project management capability over the years. Um, the basics of PM 101. Uh, that are kind of the truths that anybody who does project management hold to be self-evident, and I'm going to push it a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about a special kind of uh, data project, uh, which I call the end-to-end -end BI project, um, and why that's important. And then uh, we'll talk about a method that I've used in the past, uh, some with quite a bit of success, some with failure in certain circumstances when it was both successful and, and had challenges, and then a few takeaways. I guess I can use this. Different kinds of projects. Project management methodology was primarily started because people were trying to do really big projects. Um, and it required a lot of coordination. Um, and it actually became a project management discipline um, where people, their full-time job was to uh, manage projects. And at some point, it really didn't even matter what kind of project it actually was. If you were a good PM, you should be able to manage any project. Um, things like building a house, constructing a bridge. And I put the last one on there, bringing a nuclear power plant online, because I took a graduate level course in project management theory. And we did a simulation on bringing a uh, nuclear power plant online. And it was undergraduates against the MBA students. And, and uh, we had, I think, 10,000 different 
tasks. Um, and uh, it was a simulation, it was a computer generated simulation and you had to manage the critical path methodology throughout bringing a whole nuclear power plant online. It was actually quite remarkable. Um, it required quite a bit of business math and uh, deep methodology using Gantt charts, uh, a methodology called critical path methodology, um, PERT diagrams, being able to look at the probability of a project ending early and, or beginning late or resource not being available and having to do resource leveling. Extremely complex uh, environment. Um, fortunately, we're not talking about bringing a nuclear power plant online. We're talking about doing a data project. And in some cases, data projects can be very, very small. Um, they can also get really big. Software development. Pretty straightforward. Um, software development is a different evolution. Again, very complex. Um, but not as, uh, doesn't have, it has some uh, key differences from building large scale capital projects. IT projects. Again, similar to large scale capital projects, some uh, similar to software development projects, but having their own uniqueness. And there's a missing piece on the slide. Oh well. Oh, nope, it just moved. Okay. We added, I added a different size, a different format. Now it shrunk a little bit. So comparing and contrasting, you know, kind of these different kinds of projects, um, the Large scale projects um, are highly dependent on precedence relationship. If you're building a house, you gotta dig the hole before you pour the concrete. You gotta lay the steel, before, the steel rebar before you pour the concrete and build on so on and so forth. Um, also my experience, I, I actually worked uh, with Sound Transit in the early days as they were starting to build out a project controls methodology. It was involved in managing financials against project management and contract management of these large scale um, in Sound Transit's a local regional transit authority building light rail um, here in the Seattle area, for those of you um, that aren't familiar. And um, one of the big things was is you actually had to manage uh, your financials over multiple years. And so it became very complex just even on the cost side and the, uh, the cost management side. Um, and it also is this combination of general and specialty uh, contracting. So a lot of it has to do with um, not any one company can actually deliver some of these large-scale capital projects. So in addition to managing things in precedence and it, uh, with schedule being really critical because time is money, you got large-scale capital investments, um, but also having multi-year financials um, that have a lot to do with the financial health of the organization when the revenues will come and when the costs go out, but then also managing all these different contractors. In IT projects, we have the challenge of Moore's Law, which is um, about how technology um, will outpace, or technology keeps getting faster and faster. And if you've invested in a certain level of technology, um, your competitors may, after they invest after you, may have a lot more capability. So there's a, there's a challenge associated with IT about figuring out what you're going to operationalize versus what you're going to invest in on a capital project. Operational downtime is really critical. So managing the schedules around when people are available and when people are using the services and the, and the infrastructure and the platforms that you're working with. And there's also quite a bit of vendor dependency because um, last time I checked, when you buy a hard, any hardware, you buy a disk drive or software, you're actually buying it from a vendor and there's a lot of learning curves and a lot of compatibility and things in that. Software development um, brought out the uh, evolution of agile methodologies of iterative development. Uh, one of the cool things about software is that um, you uh, can recreate the whole thing with the push of the button, generally speaking. Um, and so what you do is you do a bunch of development and then you bring it all together and you hit the build and you see if it works. And if it doesn't, you fix the build and then you get it to where it finally works and then you can deploy it. Um, and then you go back through and you start building more uh, pieces to it and people break the build and then you are able to deploy it. And the whole idea is that every time you get to the place where you can deploy something, you ultimately want to have working software. That's the end goal. And there's always this sense of being able to ship it. So you'd want to deliver um, the project. One of the things that you see in all three of those projects um, is a high dependency on schedule. Um, and what I would put forth is that data projects don't have as big of a dependency 
um, especially the kind of data projects I'm going to talk about. We'll talk a little bit about the different kinds of data projects. Um, they don't have as much of a dependency on time. Now, that might be counterintuitive because I put right on there timing of data. <laughs> um, but timing of data is different than the timing of the project. Um, and also, data projects actually are a little more ethereal in their value proposition as far as how valuable are they going to be, really being able to measure their effectiveness. And so as a result, um, you need to be able to trade off uh, something uh, in, the, uh, in the process, and you need to be able to focus on, um, on value. And so um, I put forth that uh, you may, in fact, consider that you uh, may not want to actually have the same kind of dependencies if you've learned how to do project management in large-scale capital projects or IT projects or in software development, um, which is a high emphasis on scheduling and timing and delivery of, of things. I would actually say that you might be able to release a little bit of that pressure um, on data projects. It's also multidisciplinary. I oftentimes talk about um, BI as being similar to a supply chain in that um, you're actually moving something from raw materials to finished goods, and there's all kinds of disciplines that come into play. Uh, I'll describe that in a few minutes. <clears throat> so going through, I kind of look at it as there's potentially four different types of data projects. Um, I suspect that there are probably five or six. You might, you might be able to combine these into three. Um, but these are some examples of what you might see in the types of data projects. It's a little bit difficult um, to define a data project um, as a class because um, data is kind of the lifeblood um, of our businesses and our organizations. And so there are many different ways that we handle data. So these are kind of traditional buckets that you might say, oh, on a data project, you might have a data collection type project where you're going out and getting all this data that you might need for, um, for some other purpose. Um, data integration, getting the data to talk to itself and the systems that move data around to talk to each other. Um, business intelligence in the traditional realm, which is dashboards, scorecards, analytic reports, alerts, um, visualizations, um, kind of the right side of the data, of, of the data warehouse BI uh, continuum, and then analytics, where you're really going in and trying to find um, more advanced patterns in the data. Um, the main focus of each of these kinds of projects are in blue down below, right? Um, data collection, you're trying to find the missing key ingredients. Um, somebody might be going out and pulling social media data because they're trying to find some missing ingredients that will give them the answer, that will add to their, their mixture of data. Um, operational efficiency, uh, I got two different systems and instead of doing double entry, hundreds of people doing data entry, I may want the systems to look up and talk to each other. Um, also, if I want to be able to query across them in, a, uh, in an analytic or business intelligence space, I may want to build a data warehouse that can bring data from multiple sources, rationalize it together and be able to query across it. BI is ostensibly there for effective de decision making, helping you understand uh, patterns in your data. Um, and uh, um, evaluate different courses of action. And then analytics traditionally are used, especially in business, uh, for competitive advantage. Sometimes the answers um, to the complex questions that we have can't be found with traditional kind of slice and dice pivoting kind of methods. And so people use analytic capability to develop competitive advantage. Sometimes you might find a statistically relevant wrinkle in your data that may only give you a 1% improvement on the probability of being able to predict something, but that 1%, if you multiply it by 100 million, you might actually be able to um, have quite a bit of competitive advantage. The dangers are in red. Um, data hoarding. Um, a lot of people try to hoard data. Um, and as a result, um, it actually um, can be very uh, detrimental. One of the things people do is when they, you know, you get all the data from your systems, oftentimes people take data hoarding, data collection, and make their data warehouse, their data integration environment, um, a place for their data collection. So they bring all their data in there, and they have a data warehouse full of data that actually will never be analytically val valuable uh, to their organization. Um, spaghetti ware, data integration, Everything's connected to everything, trading information all over the place. And at some point, um, if one thing goes down, the whole thing becomes a complete mess. Um, in BI, we actually worry about egoware. 
A lot of executives ask for a dashboard, and then they never use it. They hire consultants like us, and we charge them a lot of money, and we do a, an installation, and, and they're like, oh, yeah, I've got a dashboard. I've got BI. I've got dashboards and analytic reports, but they actually never use it. So the danger is that it's good for effective decision making, but you've got to be careful um, not to develop ego wear. And then the, the disadvantage or the danger in analytics is to look out for the black box syndrome, where um, you have a solution or an answer to a question that only a um, advanced statistician or a data scientist could understand. And ultimately, if someone's trying to make a business decision, usually it's somebody who doesn't have that advanced math background. So being able to translate back and forth between the problem space to the analytic solution and then back again um, is really critical. And so you can kind of see also the types of people and organizations that um, uh, you will focus on these different kinds of, of data projects. Any questions so far? Pretty basic, straightforward, just laying the groundwork. All good? Okay. I like to actually frame, and some of, I actually have um, some colleagues here in the room and they've seen this, uh, the circles diagram. Uh, before, but I actually like to look at a hybrid of all of those kinds of projects, um, all kinds of those data projects, and I call it end-to-end -end BI. I mentioned a little bit like BI can be like uh, business intelligence or the intelligence capability um, is uh, a lot like a supply chain. And so if you look on the far left, it's like all the raw materials, and you go to the far right, and it's the retail experience and the finished goods, and you have um, kind of an evolution all the way across. These are the various disciplines that you go through from taking raw materials on the left and trying to make finished goods, which is insight. By the way, my definition of business intelligence is a little bit broader than what I had on the previous slide, which is not just a collection of dashboard scorecards um, and mm -hmm. analytic reports, but rather I look at BI as the organizational capability to deliver insight. Um, and so it requires, as an organizational capability, it requires the people uh, with skills it requires processes um, and develop processes, including project, man project management methodology for being able to execute on a project. Um, it also inclu includes the tools. Um, it's also important to deliver the insight, so it's not just good enough to be able to come up with um, an answer to a question, but actually be able to translate and communicate it and create a data story that can enable someone to make a decision from that information. And then insight, um, and I look at insight as actually um, the uh, if data is on, on one level, um, data being a record of fact, information is at the next level, which is a record of fact plus context for meaning. And then um, insight is the third level, which is ultimately a change in your understanding. Um, studies show that uh, uh, when you have that aha moment, you actually have a chemical change in your brain where the dopamine patterns react to what you expected versus what you see. And that's actually how you learn. It's not too dissimilar to the process of when you digest food. And it actually chemically changes you. Um, so I look at insight. And I oftentimes use a lot of food metaphors. So I'm actually really glad that we're right after lunch because nobody's hungry and <laughs> get angry at me for talking about different food metaphors. But I think that the process of actually consuming insight is actually very similar to the process of consuming food. And that it actually chemically changes you. And it makes you capable of being able to do more. Um, and uh, insight actually will feed your organization. Um, it will give it the ability to grow and mature and become more sophisticated. And so I see kind of an end-to-end -end BI, you know, this process of going from the business context, which is everything about your business, some of which actually generates data, some of it doesn't. Sometimes you actually may need to create data to represent some of the things in your business that don't already exist. Uh, you source the data. ETL is an industry term for extract, transforming, and loading. Analytic data store is how we store the data in a format that makes it easier to get insight. And then the user interfaces, that's the scorecards, dashboards, and reports, and business insight. Pretty straightforward. Data flows from left to right. So if you look at those different types of uh, data projects that we had um, listed out, um, we have uh, you know, you can actually see different parts of it. The classic business intelligence is kind of going from the ETL to the business insight. And data collection is more on the sourcing side. Analytics is usually a thinner band all the way through. And data integration is oftentimes, 
you know, kind of this process of the extract transform load, trying to rationalize what you might have as all these kind of uh, miscellaneous type data projects you might see in an IT organization, trying to rationalize it to the capability that, hey, as an organization, you may in fact want to be able to deliver something that cuts across all of these things that ultimately gets you to insight, which is changing in a, the understanding of your business, which is, I think, is really critical. This is where the hokey slides come in. Um, we all have heard about <laughs> the three-legged stool of project management, um, scope, schedule, and cost. And for many, many years, that's what you get drilled in. You go get your PMI or PMP, and people say, oh, you got to manage your stakeholders. You know, when they come at you and they say, you know, we want to do this project in this amount of time for this amount of money, you say, well, you know, you can pick two, and I'll tell you the third, right? You know, it's a, it's a closed system, right? If, I, if you increase the scope, you're going to increase the cost or delay the schedule. Um, and it's always a kind of um, a game of being able to PM versus the business, and you're always kind of uh, betting and negotiating with each other to get those three. And I worked uh, under a gentleman who was responsible for really large-scale capital projects, and he kept railing against this principle because he believed in the, in the uh, third or the fourth uh, dimension here, which is the question of value. And he even went so far as to say that at some point when you're managing lots of different projects and managing portfolios of projects, your job as an effective project management professional is not necessarily to execute everything under scope, schedule, and cost under budget, on time, you know, and within scope, uh, delighting your clients, but also knowing which projects to kill as early on as possible. Um, because a lot of times they don't actually create value and they're just wasting your resources. So having a, a process by which you can continually evaluate whether or not your project is actually going to create the business value that it was intended. Now when you're doing a uh, capital project, large scale capital project, and you're digging a big hole, and you're putting a tunnel in or something like that, you really can't stop midway and say, hey, you know, it's not valuable anymore, so we're gonna stop. You just end up with a big hole in the ground. Or if you pour the foundation uh, for a house, it's actually more work to remove the foundation than it is um, to pour it in the first place. So you're actually creating more work for yourself. So in a lot of cases, you, know, you want to be able to test them as early as possible. But data is actually relatively fluid. We can create it, and we can destroy it. We can multiply it. Uh, we can make multiple copies of it. Um, we can transform it uh, relatively easily. Um, and because of that, um, value becomes really critical. So always understanding why you're doing your data project is really critical. And in integrating that into your process as you manage your project, always asking yourself, well, why am I doing this? What insight are we going to get? Did I get that insight? What's the probability that we'll get that insight at some point in the future? Or should we just pull the plug on this and actually tackle something that's going to give us higher value? So constantly being able to evaluate for that. The hard part is, if you're a project management, you set up a big project plan, and you've got this thing perfectly negotiated, and you've got the resources, and you've got all the precedence relationships, and you've got your big uh, PERT diagrams and Gantt diagrams, you're committed, and you don't want to kill it. So I propose a, a little bit of a method uh, for being able to bring in a little bit of that ambiguity of how valuable is this project, and to get that feedback loop so that you can uh, move forward, so a little bit more of an adaptive method. So to me, I think the, the magic sauce, just like um, people have asked me um, in BI, you know, what is the secret to BI or business intelligence? And I say it's the analytic data model or the dimensional model, the fact that you move data from its forms that it's captured in and, and tracked in and stored in and put it in a format that makes it easier for people to do analysis. That is the secret to business intelligence. Likewise, to me, the secret to uh, project management is the work breakdown structure. And according to Wikipedia, essentially, it's, it's a deliverables-based approach to de describing and defining a project um, of which you actually create these, it's essentially a project model that you can reuse over and over again. Um, and you can actually estimate to it. You can take the scope. You can say, this is the defined. This is what an air vehicle is. And it's these things. And this is how we define it. Um, and it's a template for it. As, likewise, you can say it costs approximately this much. At least that's what we estimated last time. This is what it actually costs. Maybe this is what the new adjusted cost actually is. And then the schedule. This is what things have to happen between those. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking your project and breaking it down into some atomic blocks that you can attach scope, schedule, and cost to and move them around interchangeably. Um, and ultimately, you can actually look at them even from a value standpoint. You might say, hey, this isn't going to be valuable uh, in the future, so we may not want to use that. So, 
going back to the uh, end to end BI, um, essentially what we're taking is taking this concept, extending it a little bit further, and getting a full work breakdown structure for what I consider to be the top level of an end to end BI project. And face it, I mean, we're not really in the business of data, we're in the business of insight, right? Uh, PMing a data project is a misnomer. We're actually to say PMing an insight project or a project that can deliver insight for our organization because it's the higher level. And that's what we really are looking for. So as a result, um, you know, just basically created a numbering scheme. Now, added a few other things. Um, uh, enhancement management, intentionally not project management. Um, in BI projects, you start small and you get a, a working base and then you're actually always enhancing. It's the idea of continuing to add to it. There's a really great metaphor that I've actually was at a conference recently and they actually had read a, a, um, a story about um, building the first bridge ac across uh, the river behind Niagara Falls. And it was in the 1800s and they were trying to get, in order to be able to build a bridge, you've got to get first a string across. Use that string to get a rope or a cord and a, uh, the cord to get a rope the rope to get a cable, the cable to get a pulley system, a uh, pulley system to get a footbridge, and then eventually they were able to get enough cables to build a suspension bridge to get all the way across. And there's an interesting story about how they were giving, that they had a competition for kite flying in which people would f fly kites across and they'd get $5, which at that time was a considerable amount of money, to whoever could get a kite across and, and drop it in um, uh, so that they could reach it across and start to use that to pull across. I'd make the same argument that in BI projects, it's not so much about actually defining a perfect plan at the beginning, but rather thinking in terms of, well, what business context am I starting out with? What insight am I uh, trying to get? And get that string all the way across. So you can see even the order of what I, I look at these WBS. First of all, it's like what kind of questions are driving you to actually spend money to go get an answer? Second of all, um, what is the owning strategy? People, you know, one of the things if you go to TDWI or a lot of the best practices sites, one of the first things that they talk about in project management is make sure that you have an executive sponsor. And that's kind of obvious. Um, but one of the problems with BI capability is that it actually gets better over time. And so you build that capability. And a lot of times, and sometimes it can take a long time to actually get it built up to the level that you need it to. Um, a lot of times those executives will move on, those executive sponsors will move on. So I think it's even more important to actually tie it to a strategy in your business. This is a specific thing that you're trying to accomplish in your business that is actually defensible regardless of whether or not the executive that's sponsoring it um, is there or not. Because chances are, if you're building a good capability, you'll build it up to a certain level and that executive leaves and you're going to have to start all over again. Whereas if you tie it to the, the owning strategy, the strategy that owns the system, um, for your business, it can be enduring and you can get to higher levels of sophistication. So the first thing is ask what questions you want to answer. Second one is actually tie it to critical business strategies and make sure you're very clear about that. And third, understand your business context. Understand what data sources you can get. Understand what data sources don't exist. And even go to the point where you can do research and, and even hypothesis on new data sources that you might need. Then you work your way back as, as you source that data, get access, permissions, to that, um, build an analytic data model. This is how we actually answer those questions in a way that we structure the data. Build the ETL and then design user interfaces and then go to maintenance and support and enhancement management over time. And then lastly at the bottom, uh, which is really critical, is disruptive technology and environment. And uh, I was talking to a couple of advancement folks um, yesterday um, and uh, a lot of people were saying, well, you know, we have really old technology and we're, re we're due for a technology refresh, but it's going to be a long journey to get us to the technology refresh. And um, one of the things that I, I see is actually um, a lot of the disruptive technology here allows you to leapfrog. Um, there's a lot of learning in the last 10 years. And if you're moving from a data warehouse that was built 10 years ago to a data warehouse that uh, you can build today, um, it's dramatically more effective of what you can actually build. Um, and there's a lot of really powerful enabling technologies that, um, that it's actually a really exciting time. Environment is also um, the question of even resources, the kinds of people you need to hire uh, that are available to work with these tools and actually to understand your business, both in technology and in business. 
By the way, the green there is primarily business focused and the blue is uh, generally technology focused. Um, but all of it is an integration of both business and technology. So if you take a work breakdown structure, obviously you want to be breaking it down to further levels. And I've done this exercise a number of times. It seems like every time I would do a work breakdown structure down to multiple levels for BI, there's, it's always different. <laughs> Um, and that's true because it's always in the context of whatever business you're in, what new technologies come out, what new possibilities, even what your user base is expecting um, or what your decision makers are expecting as far as uh, experiences and the like. So here's an example of taking user interface and breaking it down to potentially the three value propositions of why I have a user interface for performance measurement, uh, for business visibility or opportunity discovery. And you can keep breaking it down to a level to where you can say, hey, we're going to deliver a dashboard because we need business visibility. And that's our user interface for this end-to-end -end insight delivery project. The cool thing about a work breakdown structure is it actually kind of gives you this collection of things that you can pick from. It's kind of a menu. Say, hey, I'm going to have this. I'm going to have a meal today. So here's my appetizer. Here's my entree. Yeah, I'll have the salad, and then I'll have this as dessert, and these are the beverages that I want. You can go from the menu, and you can kind of collect from that. The cool thing is, is over time, this becomes an asset for you, and you can get people used to actually ordering from the menu. How much nicer is it when somebody says, yeah, you spent too much on that dashboard last time. Well, the reason we spent a lot was because we actually integrated five data sources into one thing, not because the dashboard was that expensive. Well, great, I want one dashboard with one data source. How much is that going to cost me? And it starts allowing you to have the kind of conversations with your constituents that are more re uh, reliable, predictable, uh, and thus um, a, a easier to manage and deliver. So taking it a step further and getting a little bit concrete, sometimes what I like to do is talk conceptually and then kind of get to the logical constructs and then show kind of a physical uh, instance of this. So here's an example of what you could do. Um, uh, I like to say that Excel is, was, and always will be the number one business intelligence tool in the world. But one can make the argument that it also is probably the one, the best project management tool in the world. <laughs> Even though, obviously, um, a lot of people use tools like Microsoft Project and Primavera and a number of other um, specialty tools for building all the different complex um, uh, tools for balancing big, large, complex projects. You can take one of these things and start to break it down. So here's an example of a template. And by the way, I actually have this template. It's completely anonymized. And if you want, and I'll show there, I'm going to show you a couple more tabs on here. I have this in Excel, and I have my uh, connections at the end. If anybody wants it, you feel free to email me, and I'll send you a copy of it. Um, just to play around with and to kind of see. But what I did is I used actually conditional formatting and the outlining functionality. Um, and this thing has a laser, yeah. Um, for being able to kind of break out the work breakdown structure. And I filled out a number of things at the next level. And these are just examples. Uh, the cool thing here, though, is that I've also kept it from, you can see here, is that this is B for business and T for technology. And one of the things that I'm trying to do with this process is actually remind you that there's actually a lot of business question componentry to delivering an insight project. And so it's actually really critical for you to actually have a work breakdown structure item that is specific to the business value, not just about, hey, we're not just delivering you know, business rankings of the metadata, but we're actually trying to figure out what our owning strategy is and be reminded of that. And you can actually now attack, attach tasks to making sure that you're validating. Even if the task is, hey, validate that the solution actually meets this goal, well, you can also go much further on that and actually refine that over time. And it gives you a framework for which you can attach your scope, schedule, and cost to um, and be able to execute on it. So I used a little bit of conditional formatting to create this and a little bit of outlining functionality. And of course, you can add to that. Um, I also do a little bit, I, I get really tricky with Excel sometimes. And one of the things you can see here is that Ultimately, you don't project manage a project um, by category. You actually do it by the lowest level task. So one of the things that I've done with this is that I've intentionally made it so that if it's not the lowest level, it has a zero and a dot zero on the end. So like here, this is 5.1.0. And that's representing a summary. And these are all the detail items. But the nice thing about that is that when we go to the next slide and start to attach it to something that you can track against, um, you ultimately are only going to be tracking against the lowest level. The hierarchy is just a means to keep you oriented to where you're actually rolling it back up to. 
to kind of keep yourself kind of against the framework of thinking and so you make sure that you cover everything and that it helps you fill the gaps. Many times as you're working through a project, you realize, oh, I forgot something. Well, what category does that fit in? And where does that, how does that integrate with the other things that I'm already doing? So what's happened, what I've done here is that because I brought this over and added these extra columns, I'll describe these in a little bit of detail, um, these are grayed out. If it has a 1.0 on it, it dynamically grays it out. So you're really only filling in the white spaces. So depending on how far you go down, here's a 0.0. It's also you're not actually going to be filling out things at this level. This is just the hierarchy for being able um, to deliver it. Now this actually represents a methodology that I've used actually off and on for um, probably over 15 years in all kinds of different environments where you have a dynamic need to have structure and use work breakdown structure, but you don't necessarily want to follow a really detailed methodology. It can be really useful uh, for keeping track of things and it's also really helpful for changing priorities. Because you don't have a lot of precedence relationship, and because the insight and the value is actually questionable almost all the time, how valuable is this going to be? How valuable is this part of the project? And you have to be really adaptive. In agile methodology, you try to be adaptive within, you know, within a, a month or a week cycle of a sprint or something like that. I think in data projects, you almost have to be agile on, on an ongoing basis almost every other day, if not every day, because you're constantly moving forward on the project and you're, um, you're trying to get insight delivered on it. So what we do is we actually put a priority score in here. Um, and when you start the project, generally speaking, we start in the, you know, the, loosely, uh, the, the loosely chronological order of going through here, making sure you understand the business insight needs, what the owning strategy, the business context, then you start sourcing and you build your analytic data store. You loosely go in that order. But at any given point in time, you might recognize your team says, you know what, that's going to take a really long time. We better get started now. And you make that item a high priority. And so you put, that, you put a priority score, maybe one to nine or something like that, just arbitrary score to keep it kind of sorted. The key to getting anything done is prioritization. Um, and so um, if you have a whole long list of things, sometimes you get, especially a project plan, you get overwhelmed. There isn't tight precedence relationship on all these things. There are loose precedence relationships on these. So driving a priority and then also knowing what your general precedence relationship, you kind of can be adaptive as you move through that. Another thing that we do with this process, and there's various pieces of this that we add or subtract, but um, is uh, tracking the progress on here. And so I use the little progress key. We use actually little wingdings in Excel. Um, and you can see in, in parentheses here are the, the, the actual uh, values. So a little square that says it's completed is an N. So you can literally go right in here and type in an N, and you can start to see progress uh, tracking on here. One of the cool things about this is like, okay, this is Excel. This is just where I'm actually recording my data, and it's not a way to be able to do project management reporting and all that kind of stuff. But if you take this and you put a priority on it, you assign it to people, and you have regular meetings in which you actually determine whether or not how much progress you're making and which items you're actually working on at a given point in time, if you're doing well and you sort it descending by the priority, um, you'll generally see a curve this way, right? That you'll have, you'll be almost done with a lot of the things that are of high priority and you'll be trailing off to things that are of lesser priority. So you get a visual inspection at a high level of all the different things that you're working on. Likewise, I actually maintain an original order number here. So um, you can get it back to this perfect format, but then you can sort it by the priority. And when you do that, it starts to look like that. So these other items, the 1.0s that aren't, you're not entering things, they start going down because, hey, you're not prioritizing the category. You're actually prioritizing uh, the details. And you can see the level of order they are. And if you ever want to go back and say, well, what was 6.11, you can go right here. Or you can resort it by this kind of grayed out original order, and it'll tell you where it was in the whole process. So you're always staying, actually, you're always checking to say, hey, am I, gonna, am I doing what I'm intending to do here is actually accomplish this insight delivery. Also do a couple of things. We have due dates, but the due dates are usually only necessary if you have a really strong and hard due date. When you've actually got something that you say, hey, this, is a, this cannot be uh, missed. This is a, we must get something by this particular date in our overall project. So you, you record that and track against that. Um, likewise, um, generally speaking on data projects, there are really four different kinds of skill bases. There's a PM skill an analyst skill, and a development or technical skill. The technical skill um, can be used for deployment and for also for coding and those kinds of things. Um, 
But generally, there's the, the, those three kinds of skills, and they have a general conflict of interest. An analyst likes to understand things and open up scope. A PM likes to um, define everything and close scope. And a developer likes to leverage technology uh, to um, come up with new capability. And so there's this nice conflict of interest that goes on in any BI project. It's particularly difficult when you're a team of one, um, and then you have to have the conflict within yourself. Um, the other thing that we do with this is you actually allow yourself to insert new task items. You never have a perfect plan when you start. So let's say you're working along and you say, oh, well, it's not only the Southwest region, but it's something else. Or maybe not only am I going to be deploying this framework into the dev environment, but before I do that, I actually need to install it. And you actually remember those tasks. You can actually insert items directly in there. And uh, you can kind of tie that back to your original project plan. A couple of other smart things that we use sometimes to manage the scope and the cost. One of the things you'll see here is that there, um, there's an emphasis on value, an observation of cost and scope, but there's less of a uh, demand on schedule. Um, and that is one of the things that um, I generally say. In BI projects, we like to say that uh, duration is your friend. As you're collecting more data, you're actually going to get more information, potentially richer insight. So sometimes you want to take as much time as you can because the insight will get richer as you're collecting more and more data, even if it's you're capturing the data over time. So there's a less of an emphasis of getting a, a BI project or an end-to-end -end BI project done on time as a more of an emphasis of making sure that it's valuable. Um, and generally speaking, it can get you to a place where you're proactive. And so if you're being proactive with generating insight and building an asset, you'll actually be able to buy yourself the time uh, to uh, not have such a, a drive on schedule. Carl, can I ask a question? Sure. So actually a couple of questions. So um, one is, a lot of times in these BI projects, we have external dependencies like mm -hmm. on clients, right? They need to do this certain thing in order for us to actually do this other thing. Know, insert the tagging here so then we can actually mm -hmm. get the data or whatever. Do you insert that kind of stuff yes. into here? So we have a note section here that we oftentimes use, and you can even see that there's a special C notes. <laughs> so you can put a flag in there if you're reviewing the project and you see a flag. We can even put in conditional formatting that puts a red flag, hey, this is going to be critical. The other thing is, is when it becomes really critical, usually you can peg it to a date. So we also say when you have a due date on there, it's very serious. And so generally speaking, as you get closer and closer to that date, sometimes we even put conditional formatting on comparing that date to today's date. And based on the color, it gets darker red as you get closer and closer to the date or whatever. And so what that can do is force you during the process of when you're going through and evaluating uh, how much progress you've made and in each individual that's been working on these things, or whether or not you move it higher in the priority. The other neat thing about this is if you do it in a team-based environment, sometimes people are working on low level or low priority tasks when there's actually quite a bit of hands on deck that's necessary here. And if one person's assigned all the high priority things, it gives them an opportunity to go cherry pick. Even if they're not the best person to do that, they can say, hey, I can help out with these high priority things because there's a loose precedence here and we want to be able. So it becomes a really powerful way for teams to be able to kind of collaborate. Yeah, follow? I still have two more questions. Okay, I got two more minutes, so. Okay, I'll let yeah. you go. Okay. Well, no, this is the takeaways. <laughs> um, but uh, essentially, um, you know, to this approach is thinking in terms of building your assets, having a process asset like a WBS. If you don't have a WBS, I highly encourage you uh, to create one, even at a high level. Um, so when you're approaching a project, you actually are able to say, hey, this is actually something that I didn't even think about for this project. Because it's multidisciplinary, it's actually really hard to become practiced in delivering insight effectively because there's so many different moving pieces. And so as a result, you want to build your assets. Um, also, uh, the engineering and the business logic, we actually like to separate it as much as possible. If you're able to do that, then you can be more adaptive in the process. And we have some methods for being able to do that. Um, monitor your progress religiously and track the changing uh, priorities constantly ending on delivering value and testing whether or not you're delivering the value. Those WBS items that are in there that are, hey, this is the value that we're delivering, you can constantly test against that, make that a high priority, and validate that with your business users. Um, and then also, as you're developing, uh, don't be afraid to discard. One of the things that I had, didn't really point out here, but up here we have actually an item here that says not applicable. Sometimes we get progress by actually canceling a, uh, an item. 
um, by just saying, hey, that's not needed anymore, and let's get rid of it. And likewise, what we also do so that we don't lose it, because this is an uh, uh, ephemeral thing, um, we actually take copies of this each time we actually meet. So you have a complete tracking. I even thought it would be kind of fun. I've done this one before where we did a nine month long project and we met every week. It would be kind of fun, although we changed the format a little bit through the process. Kind of fun to do a time lapse photography on this and actually see how everything's moving around and see how you're doing against the priority. You actually can see it based on the curves that you see uh, delivering here. That's my information. If you have any other additional questions, I'm happy to talk afterwards. I have some business cards, as well as um, if you want a copy of that Excel file, I'm happy to send it to you if you send me an email or connect with me on LinkedIn. Thank you. <laughs>